you everybody for, for joining me. And I want to thank Jane again for organizing this wonderful trip and giving me an opportunity to come back to Dublin. And uh, this is always such a gorgeous place to come to. You know, uh, you know when you, uh, Ireland has such a gentle energy. If you travel to a number of other countries, it's really an exquisite place you've, um, to come to. I just can't tell you enough about how wonderful it is to come back here and to see so many familiar faces too. That's very sweet. Who did this? <laughs> no claimers. This is very, th th I love that. Okay, so this is an odd podium. I mean, you know, through the years you do things. This is, the podium doesn't pull in. So I have to, <laughs> whatever. So I just have to say, because I'm in Ireland, <clears throat> isn't what's going on in Rome interesting? <laughs> I said I wouldn't go there. But I, I can't help it. Okay. I'll only go there this way. I'll only go there this way, not to comment on any of that but to comment on what an extraordinary, the symbology of the event archetypally. So the entry that we will possibly mention this is through the lens of archetypes. It, because one of the, one of the, um, I don't like the word benefit, but why any why I would teach archetypes with such enthusiasm is because um, for me learning to perceive the world through through archetypal through an archetypal lens is um, like a code it's a code it's a way of examining what's really the symbolic meaning. And if you could see, if you can learn to separate yourself from what's going on around you and see the symbology that's in front of you, as I'll explain to you through the day, then you'll be able to understand what, uh, how to interpret the significance, the significance of what is unfolding that you're participating in. This is how I like to teach history. History. What, how we, how do you engage in the actions that are your life? Isn't that an interesting question? How do you engage? One question, one question that I ask people is, you know, what's an archetype? How do I even know the power of an archetype? <coughs> As human beings, we have a compulsion, and we all share this. Jane, it's very stuffy in here, so if there's a way to get some air circulating, it would be great. Thanks. One of our compulsions that we share is that we have to organize everything. We have to organize our world. We have to, or and we have to organize other people. We have to. And what are you actually organizing? You have to categorize. You have to categorize everything and everyone you see. And you do this this fast. You have done that so you have done that to every single person you see in this room. You do it this fast. And what you what never occurs to you, however, is that they're doing that to you. <laughs> <laughs> now see, by that, by that one little thing that it never occurs to you that all these same people are looking at you 
and categorizing you. What do they see when they look at you? Do they see a geek? Do they see a homemaker? Do they see a frump? What do they see when they look at you? Because it never occurs to you, tells you that you see yourself as the center of the universe. <laughs> that you see yourself as the center of all the events that ever happen. You're the center of the whole action of life itself. You are. Not anybody else. You. Everybody spins around you. <laughs> you are the designated center of gravity in this universe. Why you are. Why? Because you've decided who everybody is. You. You're the one that walks in the room and says, geek, <laughs> fool. <laughs> you are. Not anybody else. You. And it doesn't occur to you that the other centers of the universe <laughs> are doing the same thing. And when one center meets another center and they collide, it's a shock. Did you see that person? They th she thinks she's the center of the universe. <laughs> well, give her my business card. It says center of the universe. It's a real shock wave. And you will go back and say, that person's got attitude. <laughs> attitude, I tell you. Attitude. And it doesn't occur to you that you're looking at yourself. That in fact, you have just spotted a mirror. And what I'm describing to you, because you're laughing, because you all recognize it, is archetypes. What is universal to all of us, that's why you recognize it. That's why none of you is sitting there and saying, what is she talking about? <laughs> I don't know what she's talking about, but you all know what I'm talking about. And it's because we, uh, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. That's our common language, a way that we are a way that we all recognize human behavior, human behavior, not your behavior, not my behavior, but human behavior. And the code of human behavior is found in archetypes. It's called archetypal. It's called archetypal. It's called archetypal when in fact, all of us can instinctively spot a bully. And if I said to you, that person is, a, is just a bully, none of you has to say, wait a minute, I gotta go figure out what that is. You all know exactly what a bully is and all of you instantly, instantly know exactly what that means. Someone's gotta stand, that the only way to deal with a bully is to stand up to a bully. You can't reason with a bully. You can't take a bully out to lunch <laughs> and say, I have a petition here and it's signed by everybody in the room that says please stop bullying. The only way is to take the bully and say come here I want to do something. <laughs> and once the bully's on the floor bleeding you say anytime you do this again the next time the knife goes through your left hand. <laughs> and I won't blink an eye. It's over. Put the bully away now. David has defeated Goliath. The great archetypal myth. And now you know the bully will scamper away. He may come back with an army of bullies. <laughs> it's called Republicans. But... <laughs> That's the last thing I'll say about him. <laughs> but, but the, 
the, um, oh, I was referring to my country, not yours. <laughs> but, but, this is the way of the bully, and you all know it. You all know it. These are archetypal patterns. And we all have archetypal patterns in us. That's what, that's how we function. We function within our archetypes, but in addition to that, events are comprised of archetypes. The events that happen in life. It's impossible to, we are the engine of human events. Human events happen because of humans. They don't just happen. Political events or events like popes res a pope resigning or, a, a, or a, a, a rocket ship collapsing or things getting created, these don't just happen. They require the participation of the human kingdom. And that happens because of an archetype of several archetypal patterns emerging wars happen because of psychic free radicals generated by human beings and that happens because human beings go into their shadow and they generate the worst part of themselves instead of the best part and because it's okay human beings still feel it's okay to fight wars. And if you fight war with one person in your life, you are someone who says yes to war. Do you understand? Because one of the laws is what's in one is in the whole. And your actions at the personal level are a yes to actions at the collective. That's how those great events happen. This too is archetypal. You learn the laws. The way you are as an individual is a vote for, organize, for larger events to take place at the larger theater. If you conduct war personally, then war will happen collectively. It's as simple as that. If you are violent in your thoughts and your actions, then it's a yes to violence as a whole. It can't be otherwise. It can't be otherwise. It cannot be otherwise. There is no way it can be otherwise. That's your yes. That's your yes. So you can look and say, oh, it's that terrible other culture. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. The reason you learn archetypes is to see yourself clearly. To see yourself to see what mythic patterns are operating in you. It's not about anybody else. It's not about you figuring out how to get more out of life, how to take more, how to see what your career is. That's, an, that's a child. That's the gimme, 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 more. This is not what this is about. This is about your being able to understand yourself better, why you make the choices you do, what actually motivates you, who you really are, what the best of you is, what the darkest of you is, how to recognize you in all circumstances. What is drawing you? That when you are, uh, when you lock in with somebody, what is that about? When you're attracted to someone and not others. When you find it impossible to compliment someone who is longing to be complimented by you. And you can't do it. When you know you are in a power play with somebody and you can't unlock and you know better but you can't stop yourself. What archetype have you engaged in yourself? The only way you can get through these things is to step out of your personality and get into the myth that you are now living. Because <coughs> an archetype is about a myth. So the first thing I want to do is on this board, 
Can everybody see this? All right, I'm going to put this where everyone can see it. And only in Finland, I was teaching in Finland. I appreciate that, yeah. I'm going to do it. This is probably going to be the best, but I don't do sophisticated drawings. You're going to have to stand up, take a look, and sit down. And they actually had a wall that I could draw on, and it was, it was my, like a dream come true. It was a dream come true. Mason, I need also a pen. Um, this is a very simple analogy, or rather a metaphor. This is a very simple metaphor, but it absolutely works. So I want you to have your imagination. And here you go. Here you go. Now, this is you. This is you. You are, I want you to picture yourself as a building, like a condominium building or an apartment building. And the apartment buildings never move. The building does not move. Never moves. Yet, on every floor you see a different view of the world. But the building doesn't move. Inside, however, is endless movement. So from that point of view, inside of you, depending on the level of consciousness you ascend to, you're going to see everything differently. But it's up to you what floor you want to live on. Now. Your apartment building is in a certain neighborhood. There's nothing you can do about if I suddenly took you up to the penthouse and you suddenly saw how stunning, how vast the world was that you lived in, how cosmic. If you suddenly saw space and endlessness. And you said, oh my God, and grabbed the first elevator and headed straight back down. And said, I'm never going up there again, never. I'm telling you, never. I couldn't see any boundaries. I was out of Ireland and, and I don't even know what's out there. And, and suddenly the whole world wasn't, wasn't Catholic anymore. And suddenly the whole world wasn't my color anymore. And suddenly the whole world, maybe even there's galactic creatures out there. And, and I don't even know what's out there anymore. And I can't control what's out there. And I can't name what's out there. And religion doesn't exist out there. Because the God here is Earth-centric. And now we need galactic gods. And, and I don't even know what's true anymore. Everything I believed was true is not true anymore if I have this big of a whole universe in my head. I can't stand it. I will never go up to the penthouse again. Never. I'm coming back down. I got to find a floor that fits in my head. And I would say to you, OK, well, we'll figure out what floor you want to live on. But that does not change the truth that the penthouse exists. And there's nothing you can do about the truth that the penthouse exists. You may not want to go up there again. You may say, I can't, I'm not ready to have a universe that big in my head. Or to cope with, and here's the operative part, the consequences of knowing the universe is that big. It's not that I, 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 I don't want to see it. It's that once I see it, it changes the calculations in me. I have to recalibrate me to everybody and everything I know. I am, like I just said to you, as soon as I realize other people are doing the same thing to me, I have to realize I'm not the center of the universe. That's a recalibration. I don't like that one. 
I don't like that one because up until I said something to you, you actually had the, here's an archetypal myth. When I say myth to you, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a belief you hide behind that is not truth. There's no truth to it. It's just something you like to hang on to because it works. Here's one. I'm the center of the universe. I get to decide what everybody is, but nobody sees me that way. So I get to walk through the world invisibly, categorizing everybody. But of course, nobody does that to me. I get to look at people and say, who would ever dress like that? But nobody looks at me and says that. <coughs> I get to look at people and say, that woman needs to get a hairstyle and fast. <laughs> Why isn't she brushing her hair? Why isn't she going to a stylist? What is wrong with her just letting it hang like that? Jesus, my God. But nobody would ever think that of me. I get to say, that person is so this or that. That person is a frump. That person is just a, a uh, insecure, isolated hermit. But I'm not. It never occurs to me that someone says, you know, that woman can be so, so like not social, so, so antisocial. They could label me. They could do so. It doesn't occur to me that they could say an antisocial diva. <laughs> snap, snap, okay? Doesn't occur to me. Right, does not occur to me. Now I'm telling you that they do that to you all the time. They do that to me all the time. The myth that you are safe and you are the center and that, that people are not judging you at the same speed and categorizing you and cannot read you as fast as you read them. This fast, they see through you. This fast. This fast. They get your archetype this fast. You want to know what your archetype is? Go to a stranger. <laughs> In this room, you want to see some of your archetypes? Are you kidding me? Go to a stranger in this room like you will later today. And you will say, what did you see in me within three seconds? And they will have picked up more of you authentically, just like you do of them. One of the great teachings in Zen, first thought, best thought. What do, you what do we teach everybody? First impressions are the most accurate. And what is the first impression of your archetype, archetypes, your archetypal field, you'll say, I don't know, I have a feeling about them. You are reporting the energy information. You're reporting the archetypal data. <clears throat> and that's what the truth is. And this information is so accurate that when you don't rely on it, when you don't act on it, when you don't trust it, all your calculations and the rest of your life go badly with that person, with yourself, and you'll say, why didn't I trust it? Why didn't I, I knew better. You'll always say that, you will always say that. I knew better, I knew better, I knew better, I knew better. How many of you have ever said, I knew better? <laughs> there you go, we've all been there. Because the type of data that we get from the archetypal world is often contrary to what we see, to what we hear, to what we touch. They often do not, uh, what they say, jive. They often don't work hand in hand. Yeah. <laughs> right. But which one is more accurate? Which one is more accurate? One is an interior source that relies on a different level of you, which is a fourth floor, and the other one is first floor. If I can't touch it, it's not real. 
If I can't see it, it's not real. And that's your life on the first floor of your apartment building. So I'm going to go through the apartment building a little bit as we talk about why, why do you want to learn archetypal to perceive archetypal and what goes with it? What does it mean to see the world that way? And one of the, one of the you know, why, why I would bring up something like any world event, including a very significant event like the resignation of a global power figure, which is equal to an assassination of a president. That's the, it, but it's bigger than that. It's actually bigger than that. Is that this kind of event hasn't happened in 600 years. The conscious choice to step down when in fact they have that position till they're dead. When the church has never been in such a crisis zone. Suggest, and did you see the lightning strike? <laughs> okay, so lightning strike the basilica. Remember that this church was founded on a celestial event. Okay, let's just, here's archetypal. Come up here. It was founded on three kings following a star. So it was founded on a celestial event. So this is a very symbolic shift on a celestial event. Coincidence, who knows? I don't believe in coincidences at that level. Can I interpret it? I am just pointing it out and laying things on the table. But from the world of archetypes, all of this becomes symbolic, mythic data. It just so happened that on the day this pope turns in resignation, the basilica is cracked again and again by lightning, which has historically been seen as a symbolic gesture of divine force. And lightning struck, and lightning struck. And biblically, it has been always seen that way. Okay? And number three, it is a time of the great transition of powers on this planet. And that has to do with why you would even be drawn to study an, a, a, a subject that is closer to a mystical school subject than a classical academic one. The study of archetypes belongs in the ancient mystery schools. This is what you would have studied under Plato or under Aristotle or Euripides or Pythagoras. This is not what you would have normally studied in school to develop your five senses, but you would have studied this in the mystery schools to develop your inner senses. Okay, This is the type of subject that you would have actually studied more in secret than in public. And the idea of that would have been this. Five senses, the study of arithmetic, the study of reading, the study of uh, writing, etc. These subjects teach you how to survive in the world, and they are essential. And they are basic, they're basic inf skills, they're skill knowledge. Then there's the type of knowledge that allows you to see and perceive truth. That's a different type of knowledge. That's a knowledge that empowers you to navigate in the invisible world versus the visible world. Reading helps you navigate the visible world. Writing is the visible world. Perception is the invisible world. Are you with me here? Okay. The capacity to, to understand something at a more powerful level of what is going on includes calculations and it includes that you yourself be the vessel of maximum clarity 
which means this is not about you figuring out what others are doing so that you can control something. This is about you first becoming as clear as you can about yourself, about yourself. Because if you have the idea that you're fine and everybody else is wrong, you are a contaminated vessel. Because nobody is fine. Nobody is fine. So in order to really become clear about perception, you have to learn to perceive what is my role in everything? How did this, okay, that's, that's basic. That's basic. Um, I wanted also to kind of just position something because I think it's important to, to know that um, I, th I, always, I always add this in these lectures these days because uh, for me personally, I, I think this is one of the most significant little jewels that I can tell people. But this, um, there are many ways for people to hear what I teach these days. On your first floor, the first floor of your, con of your apartment building where you live, everybody begins life here. And when you're on your first floor, you think, the way you see things, is as small a world as possible. This is your cellar or your basement. And when you're in your cellar or your basement, I want you to think of it as like a bomb shelter. This is where you go when you're frightened. This is where your world cannot be, it's as small as possible. This is where you go to contain your thoughts. You shut down your mind, you shut down your heart. This is where, as far as you're concerned, there are, you are in charge of the universe. And you've started out here. And when you were little, of course, that's how we all start out. And imagine, the, imagine when you were little and you believed, I mean, I know that when I was little, I was taught, for example, that only Catholics went to heaven. Were you ever taught that piece of garbage? Okay. Okay, right? We were all taught some form of that, right? Okay, now, what all of us were taught some form of nonsense that none of, now these are myths. These are myths. This is what I mean by a myth. We were all taught belief patterns that have no basis in truth, and yet we cling to them as if they were true. And many of us will actually totally die before we give them up. <clears throat> Superstitions come in on the basement floor. Don't go under a ladder or throw salt o over your shoulder or some nonsense like that. Or black cats or don't let them walk in front of you or, you know, whatever. Now, at some point when we're growing up, we discover a staircase here. And we get up the stairs and we look out, we discover a window and we see that there are other people, maybe on a block. And we think, oh my God, what do they believe? And do they know that what I believe is the right thing? <laughs> and how do I tell them that my beliefs are better than their beliefs? I'll have to tell them. <laughs> I'll have to figure out a way to let them know that I'm the one who believes all the right things. I'm sorry, I am so warm in here that I'm, I'm really like having an old fashioned hot flash and I'm like <laughs> eight years past that. Is there any way at all to get some air in here? Are you warm? We do have the window open? Yeah, and the heating is off. Wow, are you warm? Yeah. yeah. It's Ireland, it's warm. Oh, no, but... <laughs> 
Wow. Really, I mean, I'm actually feeling lightheaded. Okay, all right, we're, we're just, how about opening those doors for some cross breeze? Are you guys as warm as me? Yeah. No? Okay. Okay, maybe it's just me. I just feel like maybe that's wow. We okay. So anyway, continuing. Thank you, Jane. Mm. Wow. I'm like on. I'm having an old-fashioned hot flash, and <laughs> that can't be. Oh. Okay. All right. So now continuing. So you get up there and you begin to, to have larger thoughts in your world. Now, obviously, with every floor, as you get older, you start having larger, more expansive and expansive thoughts. You discover people that are not like you. They're not the same color as you. They're not the same religion as you. They're not the same ethnic heritage. They're not the same political. They're not, they don't have the same politics. They don't have the same belief in the universe. Maybe they're Buddhists. Maybe they're who knows what. Each single, maybe they're atheists. Maybe they're communists. Who knows? Do they even have communists? I don't know. Whatever. But at some point, one of the floors will become as far as you can go. At some point, you're going to put a ceiling on it. At some point, for example, you're going to get to a floor that requires that you step out of yourself in order to proceed. Let me explain this floor. This is the last time the floor you have to go from seeing everything personally to giving that up and entering into impersonal space. Now, this is the place where things get real dicey for people. So let me explain that. Um, this is the transition point where you realize, like, here's an example. Every experience any of us can ever have has been had before. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that any of us will ever experience that's unique. We will have a unique experience of what has always been experienced before. Every parent who has lost a child, there's nothing unique about that. None whatsoever. Your experience of it is unique because it's you. But there's nothing unique about losing a child. My mother, my family members. It has happened millions of times before. And will happen millions of times after this. That it has happened to you does not make the experience unique, but it makes your experience of it unique. Are you following me? This is the journey. This is the essential understanding of what it is to transition from seeing everything personally and impersonally simultaneously. <coughs> you don't give up one for the other. You put them together. You marry the two. You see your personal journey within the impersonal. This is how you learn to read an archetype, your archetype, and life archetypally. You are having a personal experience of what is fundamentally impersonal. You are having a personal experience of what is fundamentally, totally impersonal. There's nothing personal about being a mother. Every form of life mothers the next generation. Plants pollinate the next generation. Fish give birth. Every form of life has a way 
of creating the next generation. Disease creates its own next generation. The AIDS virus is attempting to find a way to create a next generation that is airborne because it too is mutating for survival. Let us be very clear that creating a next generation is not in any way a personal thing. It's built into nature that you have a desire to create another generation. There is nothing personal about it. It's built into you. Your personal experience of being a mother, that's your personal experience, but do not in any way, shape, or form take it personally. This is merging the impersonal with the personal. So at times you will say you know what it is to be a mother, and you yourself will speak it. You yourself will speak the, the archetype. You'll pull it out when you're talking, and you will say, well, that's what mothers do. And you'll speak the archetype. What do you mean that's what mothers do? Why do you expect other people to understand that? Because they do. Says who? Well, I expect it. Where do you, what do you mean you expect it? Well, everybody knows that's what mothers are like. Well, well I, where, where do you get off thinking that everybody would know? Well, because they do. That's an archetype. Something you assume everybody just knows. Well, of course, something's wrong with them if they don't know. Because we're all plugged into that. Because it's totally impersonal. It was working before you were born. <coughs> Being a mother existed long before you mothers. And it will long after you're dead. There's nothing personal that you plugged into it. You plugged into something that billions of women have plugged into and will long after you. You simply had a personal experience of what is fully and totally impersonal. That's how you read an archetype. You get to say to yourself, what archetypal pattern have I plugged into before I was born? Because it's totally impersonal, which means everything about the pattern that I'm in has a route that is totally impersonal, and I'm on that route. It's working in me. I'm on the route. It has nothing to do with me, but how I engage the route, that's how I make an impersonal route personal. But I can't change the route. It's determined. A mother, even if I'm going to be a mother, now, of course, they've mutated it. You can, but, but at the end of the day, there's only so many. Who would believe that you would say there's only so many ways to be a mother? Once upon a time, There's only a way to be a mother, or adoption, or inheriting someone's children. But essentially, the route of motherhood is the route of motherhood. That's it. And further, it has, it has years to it. It's going to occur during these years, or it's not. Or it's not. Going beyond those years by forced fertility is an abnormal thing to do. That is not nature's plan as a rule. You can mess around with it. Go right ahead. This is not, by the way, a Catholic speaking. This is some, I could care less about any of that stuff. I respect the laws of nature. I only refer to the laws of nature. I think any time we mess with the laws of nature, we're on, we're on dangerous territory. I think the same about fracking. I think the same about any messing with the laws of nature, messing with weather patterns, 
messing with a system that is so perfect that we are asking for trouble. We are messing with perfection. That's it. This has nothing to do with anything else. I just need to say that as a kind of a, you know, uh, what do you say, disclaimer. Okay. But there's, there's a, there, if, if you look at the archetypal structure that's in place, if you know your archetype then, if you know, for example, you have a rescuer, who has a rescuer? How do you know you have a rescuer? How do you know that? Huh? Because your behavior, and how's your behavior? Are you okay if I talk with you about this? Yeah. I'm going to repeat. I can see it um, in time in relation to my youngest son. With your, just with your youngest son? Well, I see it, but at the moment, I suppose, that's where it's in my face. That's where so it's in your face, just yes. with your youngest son. But what about other people? Yeah, I, can, I can see I've done it with other people. Um, What's the type of person you rescue? Because rescuers don't go after everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What's your type of person? Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, necessarily rescue. There, f some rescuers are fussy. Rescuers, I'm talking to all of you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, people who have mental illness, they're they're addiction, I suppose. Okay, so you go after mental. Okay, you go people who are mentally handicapped. Yeah. yeah. That's your, and you go after addicts. Yeah. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's a female thing. <laughs> what else have I got? Talk to me. I wounded. Yeah. <laughs> All right, naturally, go. Because you've been rescued yourself. I beg your pardon? Because you've been rescued yourself. Because you've been rescued yourself. Does that sentence have an end to it? <laughs> right. You, are you saying that you want to be rescued? Ah. Right. So you, you go and you find wounded people right right you tend to go after right you have a you have a soft spot for the wounded right absolutely absolutely totally it, it, it has that compassion and that oftentimes is the um, initiation of the wounded healer to give you the wound that you will now be healing and that too is an archetype that the wounded healer has to have the wound they're going to be healing, otherwise they'll be no good at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. That is, that is just so true, because um, uh, I was labeled um, over 30 years ago. And you were labeled? I was labeled by the psychiatric Oh. Right? And I, but I, and I, I Does that mean diagnosed? Yeah. I see. Yeah. But I always, I always felt deep within me that I would never heal through medication. And so you won't. And so I won't. And um, eventually, um, some, uh, uh, a person and a place came into my world for some reason, and um, I am healing without medication. So I am now... Um, I'm now um, halfway through my diploma in reflexology, and I'm working um, with people in a mental health center to give them some flavor of natural healing. There you go. That's, there you go. There you go. Um, mm. Okay. Okay. Do you always have to be rescued to be a rescuer? Do you always have to be rescued to be a rescuer? To be a rescuer. Let me just say that um, archetypal patterns wake up in you as a child because that's who you are. And they may wake up in various ways. One is that you feel like you need to be rescued and nobody was there. 
That's another way. They have to wake up in some way. And others is another way that they wake up is that you are nurtured by a rescuer. And you come to associate rescuing with love. That's the way people get love. That's, that's obviously the way people get love because rescuing makes people feel grateful and gratitude is love. And it's the same pattern all over again. And it's the same pattern all over again. It's the same pattern. Now, what we learn is that as long as the pattern is personal, it will backfire. As long as you take a pat any archetypal pattern personally, it will backfire and it will bite you. And it's not until you make it into the impersonal and you, write, and you realize, whoa, I've got the rescuer. I think I'll rescue me first and then we'll try this again. <laughs> so if you could see the rescuer and you think like um, the, one of the best analogies of the rescuer is that you are a lifeguard mm -hmm. at a pool mm -hmm. and so long as you the the rescuer that takes everything personally is the rescuer that needs to rescue and that's the lifeguard that pushes people in the pool <laughs> <laughs> and then jumps in and says look at that I rescued you. I said, drown, drown. Are you drowning yet? And then pulls you out, and you're like, blah, blah, and then rescues you, and then see who I've rescued, and then takes all the credit, then hangs out there all day, while everybody else is now drowning, but they're too busy getting the accolades for the person they pushed in the pool. And then, of course, when the person says, can I go home now? They feel rejected. <laughs> what? But I rescued you. But I got to go home. And you're a lifeguard. I don't take lifeguards home. <laughs> you're a lifeguard. Look at the type of creature you are. You're a lifeguard. I don't take lifeguards home. How do I explain you? I don't have people dressed like you at the dinner table. <laughs> Stay here. You're in trunks. All right? Stay here. This is where you belong. Back, back. Right? You're a water creature. Right. But that's, that's what people need to understand, that, it, that the issue is, wait a minute here. I think that I am the one that needs help. And that's the line here. I need to just figure out that I have been rescuing people for the wrong reasons and doing it wrongly, thinking, telling myself a myth this is the myth that rescuing is, if I don't help them, nobody will. That's a great rescue myth. There's no truth to that. But it's your, dis your need to be important. Your need to be significant to that person. Your need to have that person look at you and say, wow, my lifeguard showed up again. It's all about you. So long as it's all about you, you are blowing it. You're using the archetypal myth for self-importance. That's what you're doing. And that's all there's to it. And it will bite you. It will blow up in your face. And this is universal. So don't, don't even take that personally. Because there's nothing personal about it. That's what's so wonderful when you get this. Okay? And what you've got to learn is, I'm doing something bad and wrong. I'm rescuing you because I can't, I, I don't want to see you hurt. It's all about me. It's a, and so long as I'm rescuing you, you're never going to get out of this. You'll never get out of this. You will never, ever get out of this. So I'm going to stop. I don't care how painful it is on me or you. I am making unwise decisions. And you've got to jump up here, and you've got to not take any of it personally, and you're going to know you are going to be so angry at me. You are at, but the real art of rescuing is to let you learn how to swim, is to teach you to swim, and then to get out of the way. And if you decide to swim away, you're going to swim away. 
but one day you'll come back. And even if you don't, you'll be grateful and I know you won't drown. My role is to teach you to swim, not to keep throwing you in the water so I can be there because that's shameful. That's not okay. And then I'll always be like, oh my God, can't you, can't you swim on your own? <laughs> And this is when you recognize in yourself, this situation will never end until I make a decision. Because it is, it is nasty. And I am hooked. And I am fueling this person's demise. I am doing it. And I've got to own that. And this is when I say you don't want to get up to this floor. This is where a lot of people don't want to go there. They don't want to go there because they're convinced that that type of, of, they so need to be needed in such a toxic way, they're big, huge, selfish, and they can't let that go. Lonely, selfish, needed, who knows what. You know, they need to get a dog. They need to do volunteer work. They need to move on. But it's really, really, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. But that kind of decision, it's, it's tough. It's a, how would they like to be it in reverse? To have someone say, you poor addict, but I'm just going to keep making it easier on you. I'm going to just keep giving you money. I'm going to keep believing that you're going to make it. No, you're not. You're not going to make it until I don't believe you. So long as I believe you, you won't make it. You won't believe it. You won't make it till I don't believe you. That's what an addict needs. That's an archetype. And the addict needs you not to believe him. The addict needs you to slam the door in its face. The addict needs you to say, I'm sorry, you don't get one more cent from me, except two cents of my advice. I'm sorry, there's no more. No more ever. I will give you a blanket, I will give you food, but you will never, ever, ever, ever get a cent. And every time you talk to me, this is what I'm looking at. I am looking at you saying, I love you and you're a liar. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a lie to me. Every single word, I look at you and say, I love you and you're a liar. You will always be a liar until you're straight for three years. And until that time, you are a living bunch of lies. And that's all you are, a liar. I will not believe you. There's not one thing. I will, I will sit down. I'll meet you anywhere. But you are a liar until proved differently. Because that's, and that's impersonal. You have to steel your heart against that. It's not personal. And the only way you get through that is to make it impersonal. My brother died of alcohol. The only way I got through it was I wasn't talking to my brother. Okay? He didn't make it. I've been there. That's why I can talk to you as though, believe you me, I have been there. I've been there. Okay. You got to just grit it. And I've been there through, okay, I believe you. Okay, I believe you. I wish then I had me talking to me. I wish. I had me talking to me. Because believe you me, would I do it differently? And I did do it differently with his daughter. Mm -hmm. You better believe I did. And she's sober and alive. I learned. Okay, now. Now, the reason um, I want to go in through this door, just to take a pause, I want to hit a pause button. 
And I love to go in through this door and then take you into you about how do you find your archetypes, where do we go, and all of this wonderful stuff. But the question I present is, why, why are we so interested in this now? Because your parents weren't. And even to think about it is humorous. <coughs> I mean, I can't even imagine my father saying, I to my mother, I'm going to an archetypal seminar. <laughs> and I, 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 I really think it's important, truly, 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 to understand, I'm going to put this up here, a little bit, just a little bit, of what's going on in the world now so that you can appreciate what's going on in you because everything going on in the world is affecting you. So I'm going to draw another picture so you have a real image of ex probably, I can't see a thing, is that one or two pages? Two. You know, okay, this is a, a picture, if I get this right, I'm always very proud of myself, because I'm very bad at drawing. Okay, you know, you know the latitude and longitude that you learned as a child? Do you remember that? So that's what I'm attempting to draw here. And the reason I want to draw this, and it starts out looking like a pumpkin, <laughs> but... <laughs> But, if I do this right, is that I want to switch your image. So over here is the apartment build. Oopsie. I'm just going to put the little apartment building here for sake of, okay. And in the middle here is you. So from now on, I want you to imagine that you are actually living in a globe, okay? Instead of living on a road, which is the metaphor you have been using, whether or not you realize it. Most people have in their mind that they're walking the road of their life. And that your history is behind you and how do we say it? The future is in front of you. And you've been taught that forever. So you actually think you're walking a flat road, just a road, with your past behind you, somehow back there. Where's the past? Why, it's back there. And somehow a place called future actually exists and it's that way <laughs> or this way so that would be future and that would be past in the direction of the devil and the angel and it's always been this way but in fact there's no if we if, we, if I take you into your building the reason you have that in your head, let's go down to the lower floors, is because we have a, we have, and this is what I love to share with people, we have a myth in our head, a myth, an operating myth that comes, that's about 500 years old now. And it actually comes from the beginning of the age of enlightenment. And it's been formed by that, by like Descartes and Rousseau and John Locke and Christopher Wren and all of these great, great minds. But what they had in common was they wanted to organize reality according to reason. They wanted everything to be reasonable and logical and orderly. Everything. Even, even the celestial forces. So when... So when Copernicus and Galileo figured out that the sun stood more or less still and that the celestial bodies went around the sun, 
that organized a new definition of reality. What does that mean for you? I'm going to fast forward and take it to where we are now. What it means is that this is how you think. So I'm tracking the way you think. The way you think, and it's archetypal, is that there's one solution for every one problem in your life. There must be a reason for this. It's something we say. There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a solution. And it's got to be logical. It's got to make sense. It's got to be obvious. It's got to be logical. Here's another thing we do. We do this, that my, if I say, for example, a prayer, if I ask for help, that has to be obvious what the help is. The help has to be where? In front of me. It has to be something I can see. It has to be present. It has to present itself. And here's another thing. It has to be practical. Practicality is a quality we insist on for celestial help. If it isn't practical, the help hasn't exactly showed up. <laughs> it's got to be able to pay the bills. It's got to be able to be something we can hold in our hand. It can't be, it's got to be able to take care of the future and ensure go below in the floors. It's got to be able to ensure our security and safety because if it can't, what good is it? What good is it? Now that is something that we grip onto. We may not want to, but we do. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. So now, what's happening here is I'm going to give you this image and tell you that um, this is a more accurate presentation of how you, your, your, our energy world really is. I want you to imagine that you're living in a globe. Every <coughs> one of us has this globe. And this is latitude and longitude, but actually these are like lines of communication, and they're active. You're living in an active energy field. And it's never, it's a data field. So I want you to imagine this is your inner net, inner net. This is your inner net, and it's connected 24 seven to an entire field of lines of communication that operate simultaneously. You are never detached from your past because it's on your internet. Just like your files. So there's no such thing as a past. It's on your internet. There's no such thing as a future. Your future exists in the Latin phrase in potentia. In potentia. It exists as potential on your internet. This is a whole different way now. You're on your floors. I'm now taking you up to a higher floor and giving you an entirely different perspective on how to engage with the way your life operates. Someone may say, you know what, I don't like that. I like the linear version better, where I have a past that's gone, and it's back there, and I have a future. But this idea of things being simultaneous, I, do, I, don't, I, no, I don't think so. OK, well, then go back downstairs and wait for us. <laughs> OK, we'll be back. But for those of you who can handle this, this is the difference between grappling with an understanding that how many of you have are in any of the healing arts? Any of the healing arts at all? Any of the energy arts from Reiki to healing to any of it? Okay. How many of you have any respect at all for the, the principle that thought comes before form? I have to think about something before I can make it. 
that energy precedes the creation of matter, then this is, this is the image of how we are functioning. We, functioning in an ener we function in an energy world. We have to conceive of something before it becomes matter. Okay, now imagine that before we were born, as, we, as, our, as our energy world got bubble, our unit, our unit of grace got organized. None of us fell from trees. We were sort of all, our, our life was timed. Our entry into life was timed. If you study nature, which I do all the time, if you look at the, the unbelievable structure of nature, everything is timed. Spring is time, tides, everything. One of the, one of the, one of the um, masterful, one thing nature teaches us is that all things in God's timing. And to tamper with timing is one of the mechanisms that is a great mistake. One of the great teachings, a teacher shows up in your time. When you are ready for knowledge, that knowledge comes to you. You cannot mess with the timing that is already scheduled for you. It is scheduled for you. What you have to understand is there is a map that is scheduled in your soul. It is scheduled. Your soul was not a construct that just sort of like, oh well, here's one soul, in the, as if your precious souls were just tossed from the celestial forces and like, oh well, wherever she lands, she lands. <laughs> that one fell in Vladivostok, that one's there, that one's there. This is not the way you came into being. This is not. Even down to the second you came in to form. Now, I want, I want you to come back to the, to the apartment building where it says personal and then impersonal. At the personal level, if I put you on a personal floor, like floor number three or two, this is low. This is a floor of the ego where the moment I put that information out to you, you want to know, well, where and why, and it's all about you. So you think the whole universe was scheduled for your birth. And it's all about you. I want to know all about me and why me and for what reason and me and what's mine and your greediness comes up. But the higher level, the higher level, the question is, for what role of service was I scheduled to come down? For what role of service? You scheduled me for what map to give what? And what are my allied archetypal forces? Because each of us was assigned mythic patterns to, to assist that have always been part of human evolution. And we engage in our lifetime in mythic patterns that have been part of evolution long before we came, and we will, we will do our bit to participate in those evolutionary patterns in our life, to take them forward, to move them along. And after we die, those archetypal patterns will still be in place, but we will have done our bit to move them along. How many archetypes are there? They're countless, and they continue to evolve. For example, we have an archetype now called the networker. That never, we have an archetype, you know, I use it because I, I was just in need of a computer thing called the geek. <laughs> we never had that before. We have an archetype called the hacker, the hacktivist activist, you know, kind of a, uh, an archetype, I suppose, that's part of the, I, rebel sort of person, but an offshoot of that. 
but we, we are always evolving archetypal patterns. These are what I would call sort of like the minor sort of archetypes. But the major celestial ones of the arcana that will always be there, will always be there. There'll always be a mother. There'll always be a father. You know, they'll, they'll always be the, the grander archetypes. There'll always be a trickster. Because there's always that element at play in the universe. You know, there's certain of the archetypal patterns. There'll always be a judge. There'll always be certain forces that are present within us. And then there's these lesser ones that kind of show up. And uh, they are maybe expressions of these greater ones. But these, these babies are here. There'll always be a warrior. We will never not wage war. We will never not wage war. The archetype of the pirate, for example, has made a major comeback. Huh? And the internet pirate can still pop in. Yeah, the internet. The pirate has now become the internet pirate. And the pirate's off the Somalia coast. And pirating has become, why? Because things are scarce again. And then they're clever again. And boundaries are becoming vaporous again. And the barbarian's back. Barbaric activity is on the rise. Certainly in my country. Okay, so with this in mind, imagine that when you incarnated, you were assigned archetypal patterns that are absolutely parametering you. Absolutely. They absolutely do. There are certain archetypal patterns every one of us has. Now we have four that we share, and I'm gonna actually talk about those. But there are eight others that are, are personal to you that are very strong, strongly active in you. And these archetypal patterns, they are so unbelievably strong. They're so powerful. And you think, well, you know, uh, that's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to find out what my archetypes are. It's, you know what? These little rascals are so deep in you. They're such a part of you. They're so invisible. There's so much a part of your skin tissue, cell <coughs> tissue, that you don't even get that when, when someone is stepping on one of your archetypal toes. Okay, because this is, this is what's hard. Come up to the penthouse. I'm gonna just share some things with you. One is that there isn't one thing you say, do, think, wear, own, live, Nothing, everything, every single thing, every single, everything about you is tied to one of your archetypes. Is that your wound playbook? What do you want me to do? What? Tell me what you want me to do. Now that I've listened to it, what do you want me to do? What? No, no, tell me what you want me to do. It's not going to happen. I mean, do you want me to like, do what? <laughs> what do you expect people to do? So at that point is when you get to say, I want you, I want to control you with it. And here's how I want to do it. And unless you got the guts to come out with the truth, stop repeating yourself. Come out with the truth. I want to be able to control you. I want to be able to punish you because I'm masochistic. I want to be able to punish you, to pass on the pain I feel, because I feel like because I've suffered, I'm entitled to pay back, and it's not coming. The God of pain hasn't rewarded me yet. I should have had an easy life. It didn't happen. I should have had all these people deliver goodies to me. I should have money. I should have all these wonderful things happen. I should have people witnessing my pain and saying, what can we do for you? 
and nobody's doing anything for me because I've suffered and I want everyone to think I've suffered more than anybody. So I am the queen of suffering. And I get to come home and beat everybody up and pass my pain on. That's what I want. So I will continue to tell my pain story until I get all that and the God of suffering rearranges my life so that I get payback because that's what a Christian culture is all about. Suffering and payback. Because that's why he died on the cross. It's about suffering and payback. The great myth. Anybody want to say anything about that? That's yeah. right. Actually, Jesus was a really cool guy, and that's his message. Was really cool. Yeah, but you know, maybe now if the church is falling, that'll happen. Like it It'll have a chance to come out <laughs> that he was a simple man, probably a married man, probably not a Catholic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably Jewish, <laughs> probably he wasn't an anti Semite. Probably married to Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Probably had sex. Ooh. <laughs> Probably wasn't homophobic. Probably wasn't any of the things that this church is. Maybe even had a child or two. Who knows? Who cares? He was a human being. Did human things. Probably went to the bathroom. Oh my God. <laughs> We have to stop with the, this God stuff. We've got to stop it. It did nothing but destroy, made it the most destructive, bloody religion in the world. We've got to stop that nonsense. He never spoke about the kingdom. He never wanted a kingdom. He never wanted any of this nonsense. He was a simple Jewish man. He would come, if he saw the Vatican now, he'd say, what the hell is this? <laughs> Big place. You know, nice place. Can I see? They'd shoot him now. They'd never let them, those cross-dressers would never let him in. <laughs> but it's a simple, you're not a priest, are you? Are you a priest? No. Okay. That's all right, I can handle it. <laughs> but, but, you see, I mean, it, it's, it, here's another mythology. The great, big, huge mythology. The, uh, the ultimate huge. But if they could human him up. And, and I, I really, you know, I actually had the funniest thought on the way here this morning. Uh, I, I, you know, I was trying to organize my notes for this lecture, and I don't know why this occurred to me, which is that um, the, the, the church is going to get dismantled, and it's going to get fractured. And... What's going to happen is that there w there, the reason how women will come to be priests and how it will normal up is it will simply rise organically um, when there'll be no male priests left. And what will simply happen is that any, the, the people will gather in small groups like this and, and someone who simply knows how to do liturgy will emerge to, to lead the liturgy. And, and you know, and, and that's and you know that's that, and none of this nonsense anymore, no it's more. Just, it's not just the Catholic religion that's based on that. Other yeah, have yeah, higher yeah. As well yeah, as yeah, yeah. And okay, and if you if you if you came up to the penthouse and we just looked at what's happening in our world, and this is the thing that's so important, and you understand about yourselves. You know, people have jobs and they have careers, and then there's gatherings like this, which in my own soul I see as callings. Mm -hmm. And what it is to be called to, to not a new occupation, but a deeper understanding. This is to be called to a level of knowledge. My role is to teach a, a spiritual truth. That's what my role is. That's my calling in life. And um, is, to, uh, is, to, is to awaken people to how 
in whatever place you are in your life to become a, as much of an empowered person as you can wherever it is you are in your life. And, uh, you know, however it is, you, whatever it is you're doing, whomever it is you're with, however it is you are, w whatever awakens you, if you're able to understand life through the mystical laws, through your soul as a mystical force, everything in your world changes and you change everything in your world and everyone is touched differently. And this is, um, I believe what's happening in our world is we're living at the greatest time of human transition in the history of civilization, in the history of civilization. Everything's coming down that is familiar to us from our churches, from the Vatican. Who would believe that we would witness this? That's what this is symbolic of, the end. To the, our familiar governments, to banking, to everything that we know. Everything. Was the Berlin Wall the start of this new No, shift? entering the nuclear age was. Mm -hmm. When Oppenheimer split the atom. That was it. From the moment we entered the nuclear age, what happened were two, two significant things. I mean, from the moment we entered that, we entered this. What switched was our relationship to time and space. What Oppenheimer did was he didn't split. Here's the mystical laws. Remember I said mystical laws. Up here, come up here. This is another archetype. The physical laws of science you know, action, reaction, da-da-da-da, the physical laws, at the energy, at the, at, at the impersonal level, these are called mystical laws. These are the operating laws in you, in you. You were born knowing this. You were born knowing these laws. You were born knowing that whatever it is I do is connected to the whole. You were born knowing that what happens to the whole happens to me. What is in one is in the whole. What's in the Our Father? As it is above, so it is below. Okay, that's a mystical law. That's a law as it is on earth, so it is in heaven. It's a mystical law. Okay, all the teachings of all religions say it do, the, these laws do not make any sense to you if you see the world personally, it's when you strip down and you get to that level of impersonal, impersonal, that somehow it doesn't matter that you don't understand how it works. It works. It no longer is about your life journey no longer becomes about you understanding everything for you. It no longer is about you saying, how does all of this serve me, but how do I serve all of this? That becomes your prayer. Instead of what's in this for me and how do I take 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 so that I'm safe. The truth about surrender is, I'm not here by accident. So long as you pray about what is in it for me, how can I get, how can I get, how can I get, you are praying from fear and you are living from fear and you're on your own. The moment you get that you are here by design and you say, what, how, how do I take care of others? How do I just serve? How do I do something for the homeless? How do I, what, what? I'm here by design. I'm part of the design. So long as I'm here, I have purpose. This is what surrender is. This is it. This is it. And I have to learn to see him personally. And I can't be driven by fear because if I am, I'm losing it. So I have to learn to read the codes. And if I am in an archetypal pattern, it's a given pattern. So if I have the pattern of the wounded healer, I will be wounded. If I take the wound personally, I'll lose it. So whomever wounds me, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's part of the journey. 
If I hold on to it, I am slitting myself and hemorrhaging and woe is me. And I'm just going to keep repeating the story because I'm now under a dark spell. It's a spell of self-pity. You don't get your own archetypal journey. And you're stuck in your own self-pity and your own madness because you took something personal that is totally impersonal. Now get on with it. <laughs> Do you understand? And you could stay in your nauseating self-pity. But nothing makes an impersonal journey personal. It is what it is. And it's up to you to say, get me out of this. Because I just got that I am on an impersonal journey, but I still want to make it personal because I want other people to feel bad for me because I'm into that power. Now, what am I going to use for an alternative power? Because I feel like I will disintegrate if I give up this power. Who will I be if I'm whole? Who will I be if I'm healthy? What kind of power will I have over them to control them? Uh-oh, now I'm really facing my dark side. Who can relate to that? Oh, three people. I said, who can relate to that? <laughs> Get your hands up. I'm not talking to myself. I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> Thank you. This too is archetypal. This too is archetypal. What you learn finally is everybody goes through the same thing. This is the journey that's, this isn't bad now because I think, okay, well, I'm like everybody else. Yes, you are. You're like everybody else and then your uniqueness is in your own. Okay, I think we need a break.